Dr. Mohamed Zikri. Mohamed, are you here? Yes. Sam Provo Smith, Professor in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. This is for your uh, fifth year. Right. <laughs> 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 so at this time, I'm delighted, not just pleased, but delighted to recognize this year's recipient, Dr. Jan Genser. Dr. Jan Genser, Frank and George Thomas, and distinguished professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering, is the 35th recipient of the Reynolds Award for Excellence in Teaching, Research, and Extension. John is a leading scholar in the area of polymer physics and interfacial phenomena. His research group has engaged actively in a variety of projects, exploring the assembly of polymers and self-assembled monolayers on surfaces and at interfaces. They developed novel methods of decorating <coughs> surfaces with position dependent soft matter gradients, conceived techniques enabling fabrication of substrates with well defined hierarchical topographies and contributed to the theoretical understanding of soft material partitioning in confined geometries and at surfaces and interfaces. Now, if that isn't a mouthful, I don't know what it is, right? <laughs> That's phenomenal. Jan has received many honors and awards, including the National Science Foundation Career Award back in 1998, the John H. Dillon Medal of the American Physical Society in 2005, the NSF Special Creativity Award in 2006, the NC State Outstanding Teacher Award in 2007, the NC State Alumni Outstanding Research Award in 2008, and the Alcoa Distinguished Engineering Research Award in 2016, as well as a fellowship in the Fellow of the American Physical Society since 2007. So <coughs> what can I tell you, okay? We talk, my job as a dean is to brag about our folks here. <coughs> and you can see how we can do that. I mean, it is just an incredible group of individuals. Of course, Jan is right at the top of the top. So, Dr. Genzer, sir, please come forward, okay? All right, because I've got a couple of things for you, all right? One, your first check. <laughs> This, the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company Award for Excellence in Teaching, Research, and Extension presented to Dr. Jan Genser in recognition of scientific and academic achievement in the field of chemical and biomolecular engineering. John, a sincere congratulations. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Jan who will give us his lecture entitled, A Voyage from Flatland to the Flatlands <laughs> and the Highlands in Soft Matter. Correct? Yep. John, yep. it's all yours, okay? Thank Congratulations. You very much. Thank you very much. Wow, a lot of people. That's more than I see students in my class. That's <laughs> <laughs> actually people sit up wrong here, not only the <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to, uh, to be here and uh, very honored and humbled by being selected uh, by the committee. And I thought it was a lottery entry today. And uh, <laughs> um, um, I'm speechless. I just don't know where to start. I'm going to say my thanks really to the end. I'm going to actually start with uh, saying thank you to my family, to my niece Barbara and uh, her husband Alex, who traveled 1,000 miles all the way from Minnesota to be here. Um, thank my colleagues, my former current students, um, collaborators, friends from across the college and from places outside NC State. So thank you for coming. And um, let's just uh, start by defining what a surface is. So I'll give you a few options and it will help me decide what is relevant to today's talk. So surface is a science fiction television series back <laughs> in <laughs> <laughs> Or, as many of you know, it's a Microsoft product that some people in the audience are using. Mathematics, it's a two-dimensional uh, topographical manifold. Or, it's a special kind of interface uh, that uh, sets boundary between materials and other physical spaces. So, which of them do you think is the correct definition of this? <laughs> <laughs> but they all, uh, but this is the one I'll be talking about. 
but just to get you a little bit more inspired, let's just see what other people said about surfaces. So, uh, Lord Riley mentioned that the surfaces of bodies are the field of very powerful forces of whose action we know but little. An American satirist, Ambrose Spears, mentioned that painting is the art of protecting flat surfaces from weather and exposing them to the Oscar Wilde mentioned that we live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. And finally, Wolfgang Pauli just simply stated that God made the world the surface was invented by the devil. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether he was right, but I would like to take you uh, on a little journey. And before we start, I would like to disclose that things have not always worked. In fact, uh, we have really miserably struggled in many times, many cases, when we did our research. So, um, in some cases, we thought we saw a head, but in reality, it was an elephant under the blanket. Uh, and it took us a long time to recognize that. But it's okay, that's what science is about, right? So, serendipity is actually one of my biggest threats. I would like to start by thanking all the people who paid for all the research and the great people that I had the privilege to work with. Um, I'll be mention mentioning not all the work, I cannot possibly do that. But some of the work, and I, I'm glad to see that some of the samples, particularly our friends from this mechanical company, could make it to the talk. So, um, just to define the boundaries, I mentioned, uh, Louis mentioned that uh, there is a word soft matter. How many people have heard the word soft matter before? All right, excellent. So, for those who have not heard it or may have forgotten, soft matter really was a which was introduced uh, um, in France um, in the 1970s, but it really became famous through to this gentleman, Pierre Chaudet, who received Nobel Prize for Physics in 1991, who uh, gave a wonderful, um, I would say, visionary speech um, uh, back in, in Stockholm in December 91, where he defined the terms complexity and flexibility. And in fact, he made a lot of propositions for things that people have been working on since 1991 that did not actually, they were not researched back in the dark ages in the early 1990s. So it's a very, very smart man. Um, so uh, just to put it in a pictorial representation, there are different ways of defining soft matter. <coughs> it comprises multiple subfields. Uh, I will be talking only about two of those, and this is going to be a very thin layer, about nanometer thick layer of organic material on surfaces. And then I'm going to switch to Paul Emerson, that's a very good approach, because this is one of the main uh, foundations of our work. And of course, there are some additional subfields. Many colleagues of mine at NC State, you can even see that we working on. So we have a really, really strong soft matter group in the time group. So let's just do a little <coughs> survey of uh, where we are going to go. Um, the polymer layers, uh, layers really span a very wide range of thicknesses. They go all the way from a single molecule, so we talk about tungsten length scales, <coughs> all the way to several micrometers. Right? And so the thickness changes tremendously, and so does the order within these materials. For very thin layers, <coughs> you're going to get a tremendous order, almost long range order. But the order gets lost as the layers become thicker and become more mobile. Right? So there's an interplay between all these different quantities in the material. Now, things can get really complicated once you start considering the fact that the surface may not be homogeneous chemically, but we can start patterning the surface uh, through different chemical patches or start creating uh, topography. So it's a really exciting, very complex area. Um, and so surface really is a very, very complicated uh, piece of material. Um, I see surfaces as really being defined by a couple of essential attributes, and I claim if you have a good control over chemistry, charge of the surface, mobility of the functional groups, molecular orientation, photography, and modulus, you're all set. This is PowerPoint, it works really well. <laughs> <laughs> In reality, things are really complicated. Right? You change one parameter and you change two other parameters. So it's been a quest in our group over the past 20 plus years, try to uncover what are the best systems that we can use to try to comprehend these effects of the different attributes. Can we even do it? And so 
So I'm not going to claim victory today, but I'll tell you a few examples of studies that we have been engaged in over the past, as I mentioned, two decades. And we're going to start uh, in flatlands. And I put this picture here from a book uh, by Edwin Abbott. How many people have read the book Flatlands? You should read it, it's really lovely. Uh, so what, what Mr. Abbott says, he actually puts himself in a uh, narrator, he calls himself Mr. Square, actually it's Albert Square. He talks about the world where people live in two dimensions. Uh, the dimension defined by lines, or dimensions defined by different polygons, and the way they talk to each other is they look at shadows, right? So it's a lot of crazy things. In fact, when he published the book, people didn't take it seriously. It was only until early 1900s when Einstein actually pointed out the book and everybody started loving the book. <laughs> so what is the flatland in our case? The flatland is defined by molecules that are very small, they are about a nanometer long, and they belong to a category of so-called organocyanins. The reason for it is that they have a head group that is made of silicon and functional groups. They can be one or two or three functional groups, and what these groups can do, they can react with an underlying substrate, so typically a piece of glass or any metal oxide that contains hydroxyl groups. They can condense and anchor themselves to the substrate. If you have more than one group, they can use all three groups in principle, which never really happens, or they can start forming these infinite linkages sources, right? So in reality, we don't actually know what is the structure of the bonding environment, but we're gonna use these molecules to deliver this functional group, in this case, the chlorine group, because we can see it very nicely with various techniques. And we're gonna do a very simple experiment. We are gonna put these molecules in a little container, and place it next to silicon wafer, a piece of glass. These molecules evaporate fairly easily because they have a very high vapor pressure at room temperature. You're gonna cover the system either with a big two liter beaker or with a small petri dish, nothing else, okay? Let the system evaporate for a certain period of time, take the sample out, and we're gonna measure the concentration profiles of the species. I'm gonna not bother you with the techniques. We are using the synchrotron-based technique of NEXAS which helps us to measure both the chemical composition and molecular orientation. But if you look at the data over here, I'm plotting the concentration of one of the species. So this is the monofunctional species as a function of distance from the diffusing source, and it's plotted in a relative units, right? So one means 100% coverage, zero means no silane. And these are progressive times, ranging from three minutes to 20 minutes. Turns out that we can actually scale the x coordinate, the time coordinate, uh, so that we can collapse all the data on a single plot. What is important is that in the scaling, we actually use the assumption that this is a purely diffusion process, and we can uh, extract a um, diffusion coefficient for the system. If we plot the position of the inflection point as a function of time, we can actually get the uh, confirmation that this beta coefficient is 0.5 with respect to the the same thing is true for the trifunctional molecule. Again, we have progressively evolving concentrations of the time. We can scale them on a master plot using the same way we would do for the monofunctional. Again, beta coefficient 0.5. We get diffusivities, very reasonable numbers. Now, this is interesting. You can see that the diffusion coefficient for or the time it takes to diffuse a centimeter away from the diffusion source is about three to four minutes. Centimeter, that's exactly the height of this liquid. So for times longer than three minutes, the molecules will be aggregating on the bottom of the lake. And yet, when we measure the concentration profiles of the systems in these confined systems, we see very similar concentration profiles, right? This is for three minutes, all the way progressively to 20 minutes. You see broadening of the profiles as we saw previously, except now we collapse the data on the master plot we cannot use beta coefficient 0.5, it's actually much more coefficient. And also this value, you see it's not zero, but it's a non-zero value. For the dry function molecules, we see the same thing. We actually start seeing something strange here. The profiles do seem to keep the same width, but they keep progressively walking away from the surface. 
which is visual design of the so-called uh, um, advancing probes. Again, we can collect the data on a master plot using coefficients which are non-0.5 or smaller than 0.5. And that indicates something important that what we have is actually not just a diffusion, but it's some other process which seems to compete with the diffusion. And uh, it turns out that this process uh, can be described by very simple mathematics using uh, this is the only equation I promised. This is the only equation. <laughs> Which is a so called Fischer Kolmogorov equation, which says that the process is controlled by diffusion and some reaction, where the reaction does not even need to be a chemical reaction. It can be anything that competes with the diffusion. Right? So I'm going to skip this part because I saw the reaction from the audience <laughs> and tell you that I always thought, up until about 12, 13 years ago, that these type of types of systems really don't involve chemical reactions. But it turns out that when we started working with people at NIST, it became obvious that there are many, very many phenomena that have nothing to do with chemical reactions, which are described by these reactions between the neurons. For instance, spreading of languages across Europe, or growth of cities, many biological phenomena, growth of bacteria, tumors, fibrous um, of replication, <coughs> Frontal polymerization, polymer dissolution, crystallization, <coughs> the, all these systems have the same mathematics and very thin there. And so we said this is pretty interesting, so we can actually now start exploring the systems further. We said we have an easy model. We're going to have two fronts propagating from two different ends and ask a question what happens when they interact? When they start talking to each other, would they stop? Would they penetrate? or will one of them prevail and push the other front away. And so we use this very simple model system to actually examine what are the leading parameters that lead to these three different, three very distinct phenomena. So instead of one diffusing for source, we're going to have two of them, and we fill them either with the, exactly the same molecule to the same, and I apologize for the color, you may not see it well, the same coordinated part, the same head group, the tri-functional group over the tri-functional group. You can see the, the profiles are symmetrical, as you would expect them to be, with increasing time. They actually slow down as they touch each other. Then we have a system where we have the same chemistry, but different uh, head groups. So this is tri-functional, this is monofunctional. So you can see the main difference over here. And clearly, the profiles are not symmetrical. This molecule seems to just go over the monofunctional, just to scratch. Then we have systems where we have the same head group, the tri-functional, but we switch from coordinated to just simple hydrocarbon chemistry. And in this case, the profiles seem to just back each other. So in the paper, we point these profiles symmetric front, annihilating front, and coexisting front. But when we submitted the paper, we actually proposed to call them the Mexican standoff. <laughs> Norman invasion. <laughs> we thought they were cute terms, but the editor did make it the best. <laughs> so we had to change the names. Anyway, so we're going to leave the flat line and move to a flatter line, which is another lovely book published uh, back in 2001 by Insteward. It actually involves a great great granddaughter of our Mr. Albert Square. Her name was Vicky Line. And she reached out to the outer space for, to, to the space land and uh, called in somebody, a character called Space Hopper. And the Space Hopper took uh, Vicky Lane outside the flat land and took her to space land talking about geometries of different kinds. Actually, it was called, I think, called Mathematical Land. And so, uh, in this case, we're going to move to the second story and talk about roughness, and in particular about wrinkles and buckles. So we see wrinkles in many situations around us, and we typically find them annoying because we think it's a sign of aging. Or we can find them cute, adorable, like when they so sharp, they have little babies. Or something that really you do not want to be dealing with when you take a brain. <laughs> they exist from multiple length scales, actually from your fingerprints, which are wrinkles also, all the way to tens, hundreds of meters, and you can see those in mountains. But they are really based on a very simple principle. 
So based on simple of a mismatch of mechanical properties in bilayer systems. So imagine that you have a simple bilayer that will be let's say, made of a very elastic a rubbery foundation on top of which you put a thin rigid layer of a given thickness. Okay. These materials have a large mismatch in their modules and if you deform the material either by pulling or squeezing, which you will notice that the material develops wrinkles. And the wrinkles develop a set of compromise between the bottom layer being willing to shrink and the top layer being only willing to bend, nothing else. And it turns out that this wavelength of the wrinkles is related to the ratio of the modules of the skin layer and the foundation, the thickness of the layer, and there are some Poisson ratios and some corrections for finite dimension, but this basically tells you that we can tune into the dimension of these wrinkles by simply playing with the hardness and the thickness of the top layer. Okay, so this was one of the examples of, of the full serendipity experiment that we did not plan to do, and in fact it bothered us when we saw what we saw until we talked to smart people who helped us understand what's going on. We took a piece of rubber and we stretched it 30%, 70%, and we put it in something called UV ozone treatment, which essentially creates a atomic oxygen that keeps reacting with the top on the side of the silicon. And after a while, it creates about five nanometer thick layer of thin layer of silica-like uh, material on top of this very, very soft foundation. We measured the ratio of these two moduli by indentation. And so when we look at the sample, we see the samples were not transparent, they were actually opaque. So when we put the samples in optical microscopy, this is what we saw, these are sinusoidal wrinkles, if you look at a, a transmission uh, mode. And so when we, when we zoomed closer in, on top of the wrinkles, what we noticed that they were not smooth. They were actually wrinkles on top of these wrinkles. And so we went down from 100, 100 micrometers to 10 micrometers, all the way down to tens of nanometers. And we saw wrinkles on top of wrinkles, on top of wrinkles, on top of wrinkles, on top of wrinkles. And all we did, we just took a piece of rubber, stretched it, burned it on the surface, and released the stretch. Okay. And so the way to understand how these wrinkles form is that you imagine that you have a sample stretched to a very large plane and you release the sample by just a few percent, and you create the smallest wrinkles on the surface. Okay? You still have a lot of strain on the sample, but the material, if somebody has a sheet of paper, I can destroy what I'm doing. Let's just do a little experiment here. Actually, thank you, thank you, Noah. Okay, so, this sample, this sheet of paper has a certain rigidity, right? I agree with you on that. I'm gonna count it. It looks like it actually happened, right? The macho was increased just because of the presence of the topographical features on the surface. So when we create the smallest wrinkles on the sample, further release leads to the generation of larger wrinkles underneath the smallest ones, because the equation that just I show you shows that the periodicity of the wrinkles increases with the thickness of the layer and the modules of the top layer. Right? So we start forming what we call the second generation of wrinkles underneath the first one, and we repeat the process until we release the strain completely from the sample. It turns out that the shapes of the materials are very similar. We can scale the data on a master plot. Um, and really the real application for these samples was something that we wanted to find out. So uh, the first application was to show if we can take these wrinkled surfaces and put them on the bottom of a microfluidic channel, can we use them as sorting devices? Right? So we pass particles of different sizes, large silica particles, small silica particles, very tiny polystyrene particles, and it's really difficult to see through the sliding, but the largest particles get trapped in the larger wrinkles. The smaller ones you actually see occasionally on top of these wrinkles, the smaller three micron particles, you don't see the polystyrene particles with optical microscopy, but you see the chains of particles with an air band, right? So it shows that the particles actually can sort themselves into wrinkles of different sizes. So this was good, but we didn't get paid to do this research. We get paid 
<coughs> of coding to effectively prevent absorption of marine organisms on surfaces. So the idea was we have these surfaces comprising five different generations of raft mass that we can potentially create a coding from. And in, if all goes well, we should be able to protect adhesion of organisms ranging all the way from microns by bacteria to uh, centimeters, that would be the tube worms, uh, which are larger hydroids, or barnacle, which are larger cypress. And it turns out that we failed miserably. Actually, not really, except barnacles. For whatever reason, barnacles and cypress have really hard time coping with our surface. And we are still trying to understand why. It turns out it's a combination of chemistry, mechanical properties, and the topography. The reason why we fail actually in this topography is that the amplitude to the ratio to the wavelength ratio is very small, it's like 10 to So the surfaces are actually fairly shallow. So we know from further research that if we increase the amplitude to the, uh, to the period ratio, the surfaces perform much better. That, that's a different story. All right, so we are leaving Flatterland and going to the Highland, Highlands. There is no book that I show you, but beautiful picture from the Scottish Highlands. <laughs> Many of you may have, may have seen it. So the first story in the Highlands involves structures which are called polymer brushes. Polymer brushes are called brushes because they look like brushes. And in fact, many of you are using those in the, as detergents or as cleaning <coughs> agents. Uh, in many cases, uh, products um, such as cosmetics, but in some cases, uh, paints, food are protected by brushes or by charges. We see brushes as uh, polymer units that can compatibilize immiscible polymer interfaces. We can use them as adhesion promoters. And people use them to create some really nice, fancy nanocomposites. In our case, we're going to create these brushes on flat surfaces. So imagine this is what we want to produce, a flat surface, a piece of glass, silicon vapor. And we're going to create the brushes by either synthesizing polymer somewhere in the bottom, anchoring a sticky group to the end of polymer, and simply mm -hmm. sticking polymer to the surface through the end group. This is referred to as a grafting onto a grafting group technique. Or we will take our substrate, we decorate the substrate with molecules that can initiate polymerization. <coughs> we put it in a solution of monomer, solvent, and a catalyst, and grow the polymer from the surface. Right? So there are some certain pros and cons for both techniques. And I'm going to point out that this is again a horror point. This is what we wish we did. In reality, the situation is much more complicated. But we're going to ad adopt a second sort of grafting from technique to show how we can modulate properties of these polymers and study the application in fields outside polymer science. Okay, so I'm gonna actually start from our latest project, which again was a <coughs> and it started with uh, our observation about 11, 12 years ago that we lose polymers from the surface, which I refused to believe for like a year. And so we grew polymers from the surface, they were anchored chemically on the surface, and we keep the samples in water, nothing else, and we started noticing that the thickness of the polymer layer decreases. And I suspected my cousin at the time that she did not clean the material properly enough, she did not remove the monomer, and she said, no, 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 everything was very clear, and I said, it doesn't make really any sense, I don't understand how we can leave the polymer on the surface at pH 7, really nothing major there, right? So. Finally, my students convinced me that I was wrong, which is not that difficult to do, by the way. <laughs> but uh, it turns out that this actually, this cartoon shows what is happening. The polymers are attached to the surface through bonds, uh, initiate the molecules that have fiber bond, they have an ester bond, or they can have amide bond, which can hydrolyze. And in fact, we don't need to go to very high extremes of pH to hydrolyze ester. Also, these silent molecules I told you about before can actually hydrolyze as well. And so we started doing systematic studies, noticing that particularly in the case of polymers that are very heavily charged, we are losing large quantities of polymer from the surface by cleaving the polymer in the initiate, inside the initiator as well as on the bottom. And so we spent the past 
five or so years that in the effect of the length of the polymer, the charge density, the spatial distribution of the polymers on the surface. And we finally seem to understand what may be the leading parameters that uh, destabilize the chain. So the key is to protect this part of the polymer from hydrolysis. If we can do it, the polymers remain stable. Now at the same time, we start realizing, well, actually, if we can degrade the polymer from the surface, and collect the material, that's useful because by knowing the thickness of the layer bit uh, before degrafting, knowing the molecular weight of the polymer which we collect from the solution after degrafting, we can actually calculate something called grafting density, which is number of chains per unit area, which is very difficult to measure. And so the system, the, the project really branched out and we spent a lot of time degrafting polymer using this chemical called tetrahydro ammonium chloride. I think the believe is a safe hydrochloric acid. Whatever safe means, you wouldn't probably drink it, but, but it's much easier to work with, okay? But along before that, my students developed clever ways in which we can actually study properties of these polymers in a very systematic manner. And in the simplest possible picture, if you imagine these polymer graphs being made of the same chemistry, so we have certain number of uh, repeat units that define the length of the polymer of the molecular weight. Right, so the molecular weight of repeat units times the number of repeat units is going to give us the total of molecular weight. Or changing the areal density, as I mentioned. The grafting density is the number of chains per unit area. Right, so that's uh, the problem. And so my students develop uh, methods in which we can create assemblies of polymers on a single specimen that feature polymer of the same length but variable density on the surface. Right? So we have an increasing density moving from right to left. Or we can keep the density of the anchoring points to be the same on the surface, and we can systematically change the length of the Why is this important? Well, just a little motivation. So interaction of biology for species with man-made surfaces is either wanted in case of variable to grow issues. So we would like to deposit protein so that cells can stick to the surface because they start producing terrible protein. There are situations which are very, very unpleasant, but actually dangerous, fouling of ships, of implants, anything like that, where you do not want to have proteins, right? So you have this really schizophrenic problem here. No protein, or yes protein. And so we thought, well, if we can create a gradient of materials, we can maybe study more systematically the situations in which we can discourage protein from absorbing versus when we can actually encourage protein. And so these polymeric grafts with gradually varying molecular weight and grafting densities seemed like a really good system because we initially thought, well, if the system is a high molecular weight or if it's a high density, they will equally repel the proteins and displace them from coming to the surface. If the polymer is short or sparsely spaced on the surface, the protein come to, comes to the surface and interacts. So we started working with chemistries that people have used in the past to create uh, non-fouling surfaces that are typically based on ethylene glycol type chemistries in the, in the main backbone or in the side chains. Um, another type of chemistries that people have used quite recently are these uh, different sweeter ions. This is just one of many different types of sweeter ions or polyphosphosines. That's another chemistry. And so we actually started working with this mo molecule um, polyhydroxyethyl metacolate, which was used in the first contact lenses because it's hydrogel and because it actually reverses proteins. Not as efficiently as polyethylene glycol, but that's a reasonably good job. And so this is a busy slide, and I apologize for that. So we created samples in which we can orthogonally vary the molecular weight and graphing density. This little square over here is actually two by two inch sample where we can uh, um, create polymers with variable molecular weight in this direction, <coughs> graphing density in this direction. I can talk to you more about how this can be done. Uh, and then we take the samples and we put them in a solution of protein <coughs> and for a while, remove the sample from the protein solution and measure the amount. <coughs> and so we can actually map out the properties of these uh, polymeric layers. So this is a thickness of the polymer layer. This is my molecular weight coordinate. This is my graphing density coordinate. The dark color means a lot of polymer. Right? So here I have <coughs> long dense polymer. Here I have short, sparsely spaced polymer. 
<coughs> and this is the corresponding map of the amount of protein measured in this case by proteins again. Right? So you can see, if you see a lot of protein in this case lysozyme, that is also on the part of the sample which contains hardly any pollen. And we perform these experiments at different uh, concentration of protein, at different absorption times. Right? So these numbers over here mean times of absorption of these samples in protein. So the first uh, concentration of protein was 0.1 milligram per milliliter. Okay, so we perform all these experiments and then correlate the amount of the protein to the amount of pollen. So I am gonna actually spill the beans and tell you what the result is. Um, our assumption, and before I show you the data, our assumption that we can use either molecular weight or graphene density to control the absorption of protein was actually wrong. It turns out that they are both important, except they control different stages of absorption. The molecular weight controls the initial kinetic stages of absorption, the graphene density, the final stages of the equilibrium or semi-equilibrium stages of absorption. And the only way we could reach these conclusions is to work with people with the molecular simulations. In this case, it was my colleague Igor Schreiber, Northwestern University, we use this molecular theory to show that um, if you study the absorption of proteins using both of these parameters, you can show that for the kinetic and control stage, the amount of protein, which in my case is expressed as the thickness of the protein layer, we can always convert it to the amount of protein by multiplying by the protein density. So the thickness of the protein. Um, plotted as a function of the amount of polymer, which is the darkness of the red color in these previous plots, right? that's what I call the polymer thickness, which in reality really is a product of the density, the area of density times the molecular weight. So the kinetic stages, these data collapse on the master plot, which is sort of crazy because you would expect master plot to indicate that the system reached some sort of equilibrium. Not for this case. The equilibrium is indicated by showing that at long times the high graphene densities actually start to dominate and be the leading uh, parameter for absorption. What is remarkable is that we have to wait for almost 90 hours for the system to reach some sort of equilibrium. And so previous reports that said 30 minutes and the protein reaches a equilibrium absorption were not exactly correct. And so it may not be surprising that it took us more than a year to have the paper published. Because we were not saying we were wrong, we were just saying, well, it's slightly more complicated. <laughs> anyway, so this was a nice example where if you work with people who can help you um, comprehend your data with a complementary technique, in this case, molecular simulation, that really works tremendously. And I move to the very last portion, which is uh, research. <coughs> I'm very fortunate to work with, with, my, uh, with my great colleague, Michael Dickey, uh, over the past uh, 12 years or so, which was actually started by a high school junior. Julie Boyles came to us and said she wants to write a science blog in the summer. She didn't care about anything. And so we set up a project for her that it turned out it didn't work, but again, through serendipity, we, we found out something which I think is much more cool. And it, it, it um, they first to origami, most of you, I hope, have heard about origami. And in many, in many cases, origami always um, refer to simple objects like that, right? So in reality, origami really means folding paper. In fact, the word is origami, but it's difficult to say kami. So the official, official mispronounces about <laughs> origami even in Japanese language. And so this is what some people know. I think I can do that. More advanced people can do things like these, and people who actually do origami for living can do something like this. It's remarkable, right? But even if you do not fold paper, you actually do origami yourself because you fold other things. <laughs> but you fold your clothes. Some people like to fold napkins. Some people like to fold newspaper. At least for some reason, the newspaper, furniture, maps, folding cards, right? So actually, you all do folding. In fact, there is folding in nature, right? Folding in proteins and enzymes, which is good if it works. Uh, if it doesn't work, it's pretty bad because it leads to misfolding and can result to some very serious diseases. 
And in some cases, misfolding actually can be yummy. This is when you make an online fold, right? In the morning. So uh, your act is essentially a lifespan that you did nature by drying it and enjoying it. So I put, this is best by the way, I forgot to tell you there's going to be a twist at the end of the lecture. So I put you two different classes of pictures on the left and the right. They show some sort of folding, right? So we have seen this thing before. There's a different folding. We haven't seen sunflower, but they also bend, or bending and, and folding in this case will be taken as, as the one. What is the difference between these two classes of materials? Can somebody tell? Yeah, what, what is the difference between this and between this? And multiple ways of looking at it. Think it's spontaneous? Can you speak up? Okay, that's great. This is the first logical thing, right? This is a nature, this is a man-made. This is definitely correct. Something else. Actually, let me give you a hint about what I'm trying to go with. Let me if you help you with your hand. Self-assembly. Self-assembly, well, self-assembly in this case by writing to you anything to it or waiting for some external force to it. I was trying to leave the text, right? We touch things over here with our hands. Like you touch paper and you fold paper. Here you don't do anything to some you just watch it, right? You don't do anything to the drawing over here. So we're gonna break the rule. We're gonna take a we're gonna um, fold a sheet of plastic without touching it, sort of merging these things and these things. And I always joke when I talk about this work, I say you need fifteen dollars to do the research. Um, in fact, Julie's work, and we published a paper with Michael Bellat about it. The paper was published, and there was a call from the NSF for an FA, like the next few days, right? And so we were lucky enough to actually get $1.7 million to do this thing. So we could buy a lot of for <laughs> <laughs> And so you need to go to a draft store to get uh, plastic sheets for shrinkings. You need a pair of scissors, you need a Sharpie marker, you need an IR ball. And then you need to cut the sample in a particular shape. You mark regions in the sample with the black color. And then you blink your eye about at the, at the sample. And you watch the magic take place. Right? So the sample falls from 2D to 3D. And the reason it happens is actually very simple. Right? If you wear a black t-shirt in the summer, you suffer. Because you warm up tremendously. In this case, the black regions on the sample are the preferential source of absorption of light, which locally heats the sample, the temperature increases, eventually it starts to relax the strain from the sample, but the strain gets relaxed gradually across the thickness of the film, so instead of shrinking, the sample actually falls. So if this is true, we can take it to another level. We can switch from IR bulb to powerful LEDs, and we can replace the black color with different colors. And this was a work of our graduate student, um, uh, Ying Liu, and um, an undergrad uh, working with uh, Ying. And so I'm going to play this uh, video for you showing different possibilities where you're going to see different colors of the LED from blue to red to green. And also using hinges that were printed with a different color. The idea is that different color absorbs the, the light source in a different way, right? So you notice that the yellow absorbs blue, but it did not absorb uh, red. Um, and so we can simply pre-program the sequence of folding by writing the hinges of an appropriate color on the sheet beforehand, which will be bringing the appropriate LED, right? So we can create a pyramid like that by simply changing the source of LED um, between those two different colors. So you can fold a piece of plastic like an envelope, right? So in this case, you actually program the sequence of events, uh, and you do not touch the sample. You let the, the light and absorption and the, and the uh, heat uh, uh, dissipation uh, to take place. Of course, uh, we can move on to other directions, and this was a work of Rachel Bank. Rachel started working on it when she was a, a high school, I think junior, and now she actually, we're proud she's back in our graduate program 
as a second year graduate student after spending four years at Johns Hopkins. So Rachel, we thought she was hungry because she was creating burritos, <laughs> and, bowls, and bowls, but she also created some other cool shapes. And so this research was later on taken by Amber Hubbard, uh, who created uh, different curvatures and uh, learned how to take beautiful pictures from Sally, who is in the audience. So, uh, and the work continued also in collaboration with uh, Professor Zikri for mechanical engineering and Russell Mayer, who was our co advice graduate student. So, uh, this was the science part. And I'm going to, in the next few minutes, show you the most important slides. So, this is the slide I showed you with the sponsors, and again, I'm very thankful for all the uh, years of support and uh, also for the support today from Agile Linux Company. Uh, the first correction I'm going to make is that this is not simply a voyage, it's a fantastic voyage. <laughs> <laughs> Those ones, you may have seen the movie in 1964. We did not travel to Thames, but we traveled to Oahu for the science. Um, this is really not young answer, it's the people who did the work. So we just had our number 40 PhD, Jason Miles, graduating in the fall. Master students, postdocs, an army of undergrads, seven high school students, and the parents member, uh, research professor Richard Associate, nine <coughs> PhDs, uh, half of those, more than half, actually five, not four and a half of high school students, <laughs> and very, 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 very many collaborators. I cannot name all the people that I enjoy working with. I have to give another talk. I was worried I'm going to miss a single name and make somebody angry, so I'm not going to mention a single name. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know how much fun we have had in the past and hopefully we'll have in the future. So a few pictures from my group. Um, my students have actually organized uh, what they call an inaugural Genzo Olympics, which was a lot of fun. Science Olympics, we even had our medals that were, uh, that were put, uh, they put in, a, in a sheet of uh, plexiglass. And the group has evolved over the years. I'm just show, showing pictures of some of those years. We have been enjoying spending time at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, uh, together over the weekend, either on the beach or in the mountains. Um, and we actually take this time to do some science. So Saturday is mainly devoted to science. So this is not a fake picture. This is actually a student working on his project. <laughs> 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 When I talked to Lisa Bird about this activity, she came up with a brilliant uh, motto. She says that we retreat in order to advance, which I'm not so sure what this is for it. Um, and we cook together. <laughs> <laughs> we play funny games. Yeah, we all look funny. <laughs> I do not know the very tie all the time. Nobody knows that. So, yes, yes. But most of all, we are having a great time together. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> This is uh, taken, I think, uh, this year. This was once in the mountains. And uh, when I coined this name many years ago, I actually insulted one of my male students in the, in the group really badly. I didn't do that. But I just think it's a cute name. So, <laughs> just a little propaganda towards the end. Uh, my students have worked on many other projects which I did not have a chance to describe, uh, and I've shown you only some of those, but a lot of them involve uh, hardworking students, a lot of collaboration. And my very last slide, I'm gonna show something unique that not every male professor or male scientist can say that, because I was actually featured in the Carolina Woman. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for it is that people thought that my first name is a female, but it's somebody. <laughs> So one of my colleagues brought this thing to me that his wife found it in a coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> so I wrote to the editor uh, an email, copied like 30 people, VCC 30 people, <laughs> getting responses for the next week. Actually, the editor wrote me back a week later, apologizing in a funny way, and, but the entire group had a lot of fun with this thing. <laughs> my students got the picture of it, I'm not going to show them, but I'm going to my colleagues. <laughs> But, needless to say, my CV will never be the same. <laughs> so, thank you again for coming. It's been lovely.
Thank you. What a fantastic talk, right? Yeah, like I said, boasting on our faculty is the easiest thing we do here. But we have a bit of time if there's some questions that people would like to ask, ranging from origami to whatever it is that you might want to cover. Absolutely. Yeah, you're willing to take Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No. Uh, nanoscale. How do you look at things at that level? Are there special techniques, microscopy, or other things that you use yeah. that we have here at NC State or other places? What? Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, the things so it depends what information you look for. If you look at, if you look for structural information, let's say morphology, uh, these things can be done with techniques that we have at NC State. Different uh, scanning probe microscopy, FM, SPM, PEM, STM. If you look for chemical information, that can be done. So you can actually take a tickle and have and you can chemically modify it and start measuring the process's functional position. Mm -hmm. I mentioned, haven't talked about it, I mentioned uh, when we work with these monolayers um, of silanes and when we measure the concentration profiles, this is where we actually go to the National Lab and use a zigrophone technique. Uh, that helps us to measure the molecular orientation and concentration, and we cannot do it at NC State. That's a national lab to do that. But NC State has a fantastic facility to study many of these phenomena in house. You don't need to travel anywhere. Any other questions?